All right, everyone. The other day in Pennsylvania and Los Angeles, and I believe New York, a number of uh, alleged ISIS agents were actually arrested in the United States. Yes, how lovely. It's almost like the things that people have been saying about the Biden border crisis now for a number of, number of years weren't actually fear-mongering at all, and that, yes, indeed, terrorists are able to filter into the United States, facilitated by the fact that they can slip across the border with little to no processing. Um, it was a no-brainer when people said that might become a problem. But it was always regarded as fear-mongering. And some people would point out, like, well, you know, maybe it's like one in a 100,000 people. Okay. The problem is that there's tens of millions of them that have come across. So you're talking about enough to make a significant enough terror cell to pull off like a 9-11 style situation. I would say that is a negative thing. That's not just about the southern border. It's possible for somebody linked to terrorism or espionage or something, China notoriously, to come to the United States under, under legal terms. For example, you had Feinstein's chauffeur there uh, that for like 20 years was spying for the chai -coms. Well, that's meaningful as well. We, there needs to be a better vetting system involved with these things. But anything that does make it easier for people to come into your country and potentially attack you should probably be something that we dissuade within public policy. Simply labeling it fear-mongering doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Yeah, there are some people that are inordinately uh, fearful of somebody who came from another country, sometimes including legal immigrants. ISIS members are not even highly regarded by most other terrorist groups. <laughs> These are people that chew the hearts out of people still living chests. Al-Qaeda didn't like them, uh, and, and doesn't. Uh, their operations are much more limited now, mainly because of Trump's foreign policy, but they're making a comeback, it seems, in a big way. Under the foreign policy of Donald Trump, we sat back and we allowed ISIS main targets in the Middle East and Levant region to get pit-bombed by foreign forces that had more adjacency, that were capable of, of gathering intel and running ops more efficiently than we could. Largely, it worked. Under Joe Biden, we're taking a much more on-the-nose approach in places like Yemen, etc., uh, certainly what's happening in Palestine, and the area is imploding. The problem is that when you have uh, all of that unrest within the region, a group like ISIS can go into some disaffected civilian population and recruit. Then they can get them into the United States because, yeah, it ain't that difficult. Right now and for some time, it's more difficult to legally immigrate than illegally immigrate to the United States. That's the long and short of it. Part of this is a poor uh, legal immigration policy, and part of it is a haphazard border policy. It's, it's part and parcel of this issue, and not the only reason, but a big reason. If you can parse it down from eight ISIS members to two ISIS members, then you still have ISIS members in your country, but you've impacted the number, their ability to organize, their ability to recruit, and all of these other things. What happens, by the way, if ISIS gets in with the Mexican cartels? Nobody seems to be asking that particular glaring question. Oh wait, the United States literally bribed certain cartels, like the Sinaloa, you know, running machine guns to them and stuff like that. Remember Fast and Furious? Our foreign policy makes absolutely no sense, our border policy even less. I would think that this should be, you know, on people's minds. This wasn't just, okay, one person, a person who was potentially linked to Al-Qaeda or ISIS or something like that was discovered by the FBI living in Los Angeles. No, this is three different states. And think, if you catch eight people, there are a lot more that you didn't catch. Maybe it's 80, maybe it's 800, maybe it's 8,000, who knows. But they're actually there. Yes, there should be some degree of fear. Not panic, but concern. It would be wise to be concerned about that sort of thing. ISIS is not a homegrown sort of U.S. experience thing. Yes, there have been ISIS members, uh, that they, they've pledged their loyalty, or Al-Qaeda, or Boko Haram, uh, that have cropped up in other countries. By and large, though, the chunk, the main chunk of the problem is that ISIS still has resources. They are a centralized organization. It's not just a, a, a smack dab conglomerate of people who got on pickup trucks. That's, that's sort of the facade, the appearance. They're also effectively a globalistic corporation when you think about it. They've got oil, they've got mineral resources, they've got land, they're effectively a state, non-state actor in some parts of the world. Libya got completely overrun 
uh, in the wake of, uh, of Clintonian foreign policy under Obama. Remember that with Benghazi and all of the other things that happened there. Now there's a bunch of slavery. Well, I'm sure they make plenty of money selling 12-year-olds. You think ISIS is not involved in these things? They don't just simply exist in a vacuum. You do have to have resources. You have to have something to pay the bills or else your soldiers starve. They do make money and lots of it. Not just the old-time war chest before they were decimated in the middle of the 2010s under Trump's foreign policy, or at the end, rather, of the 2010s. Um, ISIS, uh, y you can assume that some people are wandering across the border, and this happens every day because there's thousands of them, that have ties to international cartels, the mafia, uh, uh, you know, military groups, paramilitary groups in Africa and Asia and places like that, communists, and of course, members of terrorist organizations. I mean, you cannot avoid it. It's obvious that it's going to happen. And when they're coming into the country, they're probably not doing it to buy a suburban house with a white picket fence. They're probably not intending to do that. Maybe some of them de-radicalize. They get to the United States, they have their first McDonald's hamburger. They say, yeah, this is pretty great. Not the great Satan, more like the, the great big pie in the sky, uh, it's, it's, it's a giant McDonald's, this is great. That's not going to be the average person, though. And these are organized uh, systems by which they uh, do these things. So this isn't individual ISIS members randomly up and decided to go to the United States individually. They were probably all in communication with each other. In their case, because it's part of a larger sting operation across multiple states, it's presumptive that that's how they were caught. Well, that's the good news. Hey, eight potential ISIS members are off the streets. The bad news is that the United States, like is not, just kicks them back across the border at this point and doesn't even prosecute or attempt any further investigation. I would love to believe that our federal bureaus are competent enough to do so and have the wherewithal, but at the moment, I don't trust the administration enough to actually administrate such a thing. That's about all. Peace out.